How are you? I don't think you're late. I think okay, good. You know, well, maybe you, well, by early. one minute, <laughs> which isn't really Davos late. I mean, Davos is. Uh, I think you get five minutes, maybe five minutes. There, we'll take the five. Uh, Great. What a pleasure to meet you. You too. How are you? I'm very well, thank you very much. Um, Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce Idris and Sabrina Elba, uh, UN Goodwill Ambassadors, and also you have a few other jobs. Uh, <laughs> He's got quite a few other jobs. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I'm, uh, I'm African, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> I have jobs. Yeah. Um, anyone who knows anything about Londoners uh, knows that there's a fair amount of rivalry between different different parts of London, so. Is this where you tell me you're, you're a Tottenham fan? Uh, mate, come on, man. <laughs> I'm a Charlton fan. Oh, OK. No, that's misery. That is football misery. It's a London team, good team. <laughs> so I was, bo I was born at the, in the same year as Idris. Idris, of course, born in East London in Hackney. I was born in South East London in Woolwich. Um, so, um, I, I, you know, I have to say that I... It, with the little that I've achieved in life, I pinch myself <laughs> that I'm here now. Do you, do you have that same feeling? Do you, do you have that same... <laughs> <laughs> or are you just so, you know, no, no, no. as confident as you seem that, you know... I, I come from... I was actually born in a, in a small place called Forest Gate, which is about two miles away from Hackney. And Forest Gate Hospital... It's a tiny little place. My parents lived in Hackney, Hackney, and the nearest hospital was Forest Gate, and that's where I was born. Okay, my parents came from Sierra Leone. Uh, my mum's Ghanaian, and my dad's Sierra Leone, but my both they both lived in Sierra Leone. So I say this to say that you know I I, I pinch myself all the time. My parents mm. came 1971 with big dreams. Um, uh, had one child. Uh, we lived in a small council flat. Council flat, as in you know, like a a project, you know, uh, and, you know, my dad worked at Ford Motor Company for 25 years. My mum worked as a clerical assistant uh, and their only child wo woke up one day and said, oh, I'm going to be an actor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my dad was like, doing what? <laughs> Acting? <Anyway. laughs> and, um, you know, I, I, I cut Fast forward to here and being allowed to sit in this room uh, with my partner in crime and wife and these wonderful people and, and, and talking about things that actually, that hard work that I've done as an actor from being 19 practically to now allows me the platform to use my voice in areas that I am not qualified to be in, <laughs> <laughs> quite frankly. Or, or amply qualified. Maybe. Well, yeah, I mean, depending on how you look I, at it. Yeah. You know, and, you know, I come from a generation that saw hip-hop emerge and saw the 80s <laughs> and saw, you know, Margaret Thatcher, <laughs> you know, uh, and saw Trump. You know, I've seen it all. So <laughs> here's the thing, you know, we, when, you, when, you, when you have that sort of life experience, you know, I think it becomes more about what can you... How can you articulate what you're feeling? Um, doesn't matter that I can do it at the forum, but can I articulate what I'm feeling? Do I have a point of view? Mm. Uh, and that's, that's what I'm doing, you know? I, I don't sit here as an expert in food securities. I sit as a citizen of the globe. Mm. I'm, like most people, mortified about the disparity of wealth, uh, mortified about what we're doing to our planet. And so here I sit. Yeah. Um, and let's talk about where that comes from. Uh, my, my best friend is uh, from Sierra Leone. Oh, yeah. Um, so I've spent many years there. Really? Uh, How the body? The body fine. Wow. <laughs> I was not excited. That that's, that's the only sentence I know. Is, uh, Please don't mind. try and... To, <laughs> <laughs> Please don't take that any Sabrina, That's Sabrina's. That's my line. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. So it keeps me and my mother-in-law in good uh, standing. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the Let me just ask quickly, since you, you know, because you guys also, it's a bit of a segue, but we'll get back to Sierra Leone in a moment, and also to uh, East Africa, of course. But you guys have your podcast, you, you know, you, you have this whole other line, talking about many jobs, in kind of talking to people about how to... How to well, you tell me, navigate a relationship or something? Like, tell me, tell me what. Yeah, f and well, like no, actually, because <laughs> we're <n> <laughs> we were newlyweds when we started it, but we 
At the kind of beginning of the pandemic, we had COVID. I feel like you probably all know that because I just was on CNN telling everyone he had COVID. Um, <laughs> I was there with, I know better, I was in the video. That was one of my greatest <laughs> career moves. <laughs> We, you know, we were exploring wellness. Like at the time, there was so much misinformation. I kind of convinced myself it was like my fault that I got COVID because my immune system was low. I don't know. I had my family calling from Africa, drink hot water, and like, you know, you need to work on yourself. And I was like, oh my god, I'm so sorry, I have it. <laughs> and uh, looking at wellness and exploring what that meant for me as a person of color, like it felt like a very um, kind of niche space uh, for one type of person, one gender. Anyways, I say that to say in that exploration, we realized actually that a big part of our wellness had to do with the communities around us, had to do with the relationships in our lives. Because more than anything, what was affecting us the most was the people we missed that we couldn't see in lockdown. So we realized relationships are so important. And then that spun into there's so many different kinds of relationships. I mean, we're talking familial, partnerships, best friends, the relationship you have with yourself, the relationship you have with the planet. And we thought this needs to be a topic of discussion. And as newlyweds, how can we best learn? We can learn by talking to people we respect and admire in that space. So we started this podcast called Coupledom. Um, and we've had amazing conversations with amazing duos. I mean, everyone from like, you know, Kim Kardashian and Kris Jenner, which is like kind of flashy, but like Ben and Jerry's, who we really admire in business and how they've sewed their ethics into their business. And, and it's been a fun ride. And, you know, we're looking at starting it up again. Um, it just is very busy. <laughs> so we had a lot of time during COVID, but having to find some time again. Um, but thanks for asking about it, because it does feel like one of those things that has shifted the paradigm of my thinking into how, you know, it's the first thing you learn in school, the buddy system. Take a friend when you go to the bathroom and somewhere along the line, we've lost this sense of collaboration. It's one of the themes of this Davos as well, working yeah. together. And we work for a yeah. number of different agencies. And we constantly work on how do we bring the agencies together. And Alvaro, our president of EFAD, who we are Goodwill ambassadors for, will know. We're always like, so have you heard about this agency and that? And how can we bring everyone together? And I think collaboration is so important. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about that. But let's just for a moment pause to talk about. So I mentioned uh, my uh, my own connection through my best friend to Sierra Leone, you know, shout out to John Cisse. Um, and um, let's just talk about how, what an incredible place West Africa is and mm. Sierra Leone is. Yeah. Um, the beauty of the place, the people. Um, there's a beach about an hour's drive from Freetown called Beach Number no. Two, mm. which is weird because there doesn't seem to be a beach number one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it is paradise. Yeah. 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 West Africa um, is beautiful. You know, before there were borders, that region is probably the most beautiful, you know, wing of Africa and still is. Um, and the people, as you say, have, you know, such a rich culture, history uh, and tragedy. You know, West Africa being the sort of hub of slavery, uh, that part of the world still yeah. remains to have uh, an incredible character characteristics. Sierra Leone has been hit and hit many, many times with um, very uh, devastating uh, um, adversity, which it has recovered from over and over again. Um, and as it relates to me and my family, you know, we feel proud to be survivors or people that are part of a survival group that haven't given up, that haven't lost their heritage, that haven't lost their, their hope. You know, and, you know, we sit in an incredible seat of privilege uh, while some of our brothers and sisters don't have a, a voice to speak up about the disprivileges. So that's why, I, you know, I, I end up, and I'm, I, you didn't ask me that question, but essentially no, but it's, good. it's a driver for me as to why I sit in the seat talking about things that essentially affect us all and why I, I, we feel compelled to keep going and keep going. Yeah, and the... What you have uh, kind of doubled down on, if you like, is the question of farming. Mm. And, and that, it's interesting because it's, it's so crucial. Mm. But you tell us, what, why, how did you get there and, and why is that the, the thing that you have kind of honed in on as, as what needs to change in order to improve mm. people's I mean, lives? It's a shared journey. I think Sabrina has a lot of influence in what, why, and I'll let Sabrina tell that story as well. But I think also at a junction, 
where, you know, just the realization that, um, look, in the 80s, you know, Ethiopia was going through an incredible, devastating famine. And I just never will forget looking at children that were a little bit younger than me. You know, with, you've seen those images and it stuck with me. And my mum and dad would be like, my dad especially would be like, always oh, putting Africa on the TV like that. That's what they're saying, that's what Africa looks like. That's so interesting. And I don't want you to take, to take you away from talking about the work, which we must talk about mm. in detail, but, but how do you talk about this stuff without plugging into a kind of post-colonial racism kind of thing? How, how, do, you, how do you get people to uh, engage in the challenges while at the same time mm. getting that message right and celebrating the, the, those, that part of the world? Well, I mean, I think the work that we focus on now uh, in actually in any philanthropic venture we, we uh, you know, find ourselves in is more about investing in the people that we support as opposed to, you know, sometimes what can be a short-sighted aid kind of focused model. And obviously, um, when there's a famine, people need help then and there. Right. But why do famines keep happening again and again? We need to look at longer term solutions that help empower the people on the ground who are actually taking care of the land so that they can feed themselves, build a sense of entrepreneurship and independence. And that's the work we do with EFAD and some of the other organizations we work as, with as well, mm -hmm. just to be able to kind of move away from that handout model that isn't, isn't good for anyone. Mm. And it isn't good for the continent. It's solutions. It's solution-based yeah. that we look at. And I think, you know, so with that framing, we don't find ourselves in the language of aid. You know, yeah. we find ourselves in the language of solutions and investment. Yeah. Mm. And, and making that, um, that shift in, in the narrative is so important because I grew up with that, those commercials and I grew up with a stigma. And I grew up with a stigma that, you know, the rural people weren't hardworking or just waiting for mm. handouts. and. Mm. Absolutely not. I mean, my family <laughs> probably have 10 jobs each. <laughs> Look at Idris, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and <laughs> it's, it's true. Rural people work so hard. They just are, need the investment. They just need the investment. And guess what? The investment is good for all of us. Yeah, I was in Turkana in northern Kenya um, late last year and, and saw that, saw, uh, you know, farming people who'd lost their livestock because of the drought. People, and I think you've said it very eloquently, who are the victims of climate change, didn't cause climate change or enormous, it's tiny, infinitesimal mm. uh, contribution to climate change. Yeah. Uh, your, so your perspective is East Africa, obviously, you know, which yeah. is... It's like, I like this, this connection. It's like West we Africa, stand, East Africa, the yeah, continent, across the tracks. Actually, on both, we cap both ends. Right. So, and it was yeah, actually Sabrina's thing. mother that, you know, really put uh, us onto, you know, the, uh, yeah. put, put the, put the uh, EFAD Ifa, on our radar. Right. It was Sabrina's mother who comes from a small rural community who uh, had farm to mouth, you know, and that was the existence and part of their growth. And, but it wasn't, a, it was a positive. I mean, she, her yeah. pastoral memories are so beautiful. She talks about, you know, the, waking up every morning with her camels and being, you know, sort of in, in on just on the land and, and having the most, the best days. And she, she wanted to return to that after coming to Canada in the 80s. Like, I mean, she left before the war. She wanted, she wanted to go back to enjoy that type of lifestyle. So I think, you know, people, and we see it now, I mean, there's this weird kind of, um, you know, if you, if you have to go work in the agricultural sector or outside of the cities, like you're doing something wrong as a young person, you should be going to urban areas. But no, actually, you know, the, the opportunity is in agriculture. And we're seeing when we go and do these visits now that young people get it and they want that sense of entrepreneurship. And they're like, oh, OK, great. So how do we yeah. get out of the cities and go back, actually? And they find that their parents are quite more successful than they would have thought. Yeah. Um, yeah. But there's this nice shift back. Um, but at the same time, you know, it only takes one drought or one flood or one catastrophe to to leave a catastrophic uh, impact on people who are in these rural areas so they can't do it alone and it's the support that's needed to be able to uh, not only mitigate it, climate change when it happens but help people adapt and create solutions and we see so many solutions and I'm sorry I'm going on a rant now but we see but so you should many. though you, you, we want to hear I mean this because we in particular talking about smallholder farmers like, what is what are the specific things 
Because I hear you. I mean, I was there, and it's clear that you just you, there is that aspect of it. Just something needs to be done you, yeah. in places where they have had a year after year of drought. Yeah. But then there's also this sustainability question, which absolutely. So could talk a little bit more about that in detail about what you see yeah. as that. I mean, I, for me, it's, it's innovation and it's tech and it's uh, diaspora investing and it's private sector investing and, you know, the philanthropic ventures will work in the interim, but we need private sector to come in and invest in these solutions. If you don't know what the weather is going to be tomorrow, how are you supposed to farm? It's just simple, simple things. Um, and, you know, and a lot of the programs that I see on EFAT, it's those simple things that make these massive changes for, for people on the ground. And those are the stories that I take in so deeply when I hear, you know, a mother sent her children to school and, and bought this house and she's like the talk of the neighborhood because she's got this slight piece of um, advanced technology compared to everyone else in the in her rural community. It makes that much difference and everyone mm. wants a piece of it. Yeah. Um, but how do we all uh, get ourselves involved in that innovation and how do we all get ourselves involved in that tech? Because we can't just leave it to government and, and private sector. We need to look at uh, ways that, you know, Idris always talks about diaspora investing back in. there. And you know, I love that you say this, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to steal this from you. I steal a lot of things from you. Um, you know, <laughs> there's already a Disney, there's already a, a Warner Brothers, there's already, there's already a, you know, Virgin, there's, there's all these massive corporations outside of Africa. There's so much opportunity to have them in Africa. And you start that by investing in the youth there. It's a growing, budding population, so vibrant, so many ideas. I mean, we met with Global Shapers earlier today, and it was just like, they're all smarter than us, which is kind of like they should be. And young people really know what they're doing. And when it comes with this sort of innovative framework of thinking, I'm like, these are the people that the world should be investing in. You know, you think about Africa and you think about where its population is growing, it's going to double. Okay, and um, outside of just the food security conversation around, you know, investing in small farmers and making sure they can feed themselves and, f and, and not rely on imports, okay, there is the employment conversation, mm -hmm. you know. And, you know, when you speak about farming, you're thinking about farms, but actually the ecosystem around farming is everything from technology, as Sabrina says, startup industries, communication, com you know, if the, the industry of farming for a very long time has supported many sectors and offers a lot of opportunities. In the film industry, when you get one good idea, it unlocks other good ideas in the rest of the story. Mm. Mm. And this, what, that's what farming, for me, is like. Mm. And you can unlock the fact that, you know, smallholder farmers who take up a lot of the land, who actually fight for their rights for the land, okay, but when they get them, they're empowered, they are a business, mm. and their partners are businesses. For me, it's really important, you know, like this is a, a co-op of thought. You know, we're, we're, we're all together, we're, we're thinking together in farming. When the, when the farmers talk together and they form co-ops, they, they become much stronger. The yields are better, mm. the, the practices are better, the communication is better, and then the pricing is better because they're all doing the same thing. So that's why for us, you know, the, the smallholder farming, it's a good idea in a bad script. And once you get it right, <laughs> it would unlock many more good ideas. And then we can all watch a film and feel satisfied. <laughs> How yeah. did I get there? I don't know. I'm sorry. But, no, but it um, makes sense. You want that happy ending. And there's so much more involved when you're talking about agriculture, you're talking about gender, you're talking about climate, you're talking about like all these things are so interconnected. And I think, you know, before it's trendy or or whatever it is to, to start acting on these things, it's, it's important to build our understanding around how the world is so interconnected, yeah. what food systems are, how do they work for us, why are they so fragile? Yeah. Um, you know, and just to build that awareness, because if you're championing one cause, I guarantee you it's connected to another. I was going to say, this is a, that's, that's how you've got to the climate change uh, campaign yeah. that you are also yes. doing, right? We're both um, on the board, uh, respectively, of CI, um, Conservation International Europe with Sabrina and me in the in the um, American board and you know it's all interla inter in, in, interlated you know um, what we're realizing is that if we invest in small home of holder farmers in natural based solutions mm -hmm. you are enriching the ecosystems that you know will absorb the um, um, the, the, the emissions basically and and mm -hmm. the more we can 
feed that cycle, the, the, the better it is. So again, it's a, it unlocks other problems as well. But you can't have, and Sabrina says it all the time, you can't have a conversation about food without having a conversation about climate because it is climate that is damaging and, and, and stopping smallholder farmers um, as well as lack of investment from feeding themselves. Um, and we can obviously see what happens when borders get in the way. So when, you know, a war that happens in, or an invasion that happens from Russia to Ukraine and how that affects Africa in a, in a crazy, crazy way, that's nothing to do with climate until, well, <laughs> they can't eat, they can't grow because the climate shifted. And, you know, you know, smallholder farmers provide 80% of food. So at some junction, that cycle will end up in a restaurant near you. <laughs> okay? That's how it works. And that's, I think that's where EFAD has an incredible system of trying to amplify this. Um, agriculture isn't something that everyone, yeah, let's talk about farming. But well, as we saw in the pandemic, um, food shortage is a real deal it, ha it can happen and it happened within that sort of 36 cycle 36 month cycle where food banks in LA with cool people in California were at food banks because they couldn't buy food mm. so this is why it's important for you know for all of us to sort of have that understanding of it education and then lobbying governments lo lobbying change makers mm. lobbying investors to kind of think about the solutions looking at IFA, looking at companies like CI that kind of go, okay, here's how we can do this, you know? Yeah, um, it's just a conversation. Let's ask, let's see if anyone has, I bet people do. <laughs> um, yeah. That guy, yeah. <laughs> Hi, thanks. Um, I'm from Alex Eaton from Mexico. I run an organization called Sistema Bio and we work with smallholder <laughs> farmers all over the world, providing technology investment and recently we've been able to channel a lot of climate funding to farmers, but we believe that the market-based solutions are really important. Uh, one of the things that we fight a lot against is that the perception of a smallholder farmer is one that's almost synonymous with poverty. In Mexico, it's the campesino. In, in Kenya, for example, where our biggest office is, is um, this perception of going to the city as being the smart decision. And so what a lot of our local teams are always asking me to do is find representatives to convince people that uh, farming is cool, it's dignified, it's important. The, so we talk about farm heroes and, and, and finding representatives. So I'm, is, it, is this a pitch? Are you, are you <laughs> I'm almost there. I don't actually hey, know he's got me. <laughs> yeah. Where do I sign? In Kenya, but I'm just curious, in your communities, um, uh, is it... Uh, something that you think finding other representatives to to put voice and talk about smallholder farming is something that's really important because IFAD uh, does a fabulous job talking about agriculture from a, from in a very technical way but I think it is also important that mainstream voices talk about um, you know we've even talked to people about producing movies where you know smallholder farmers are in not just in the background as scenery but actually protagonists and that sort of thing so I'm curious within your communities, uh, if this idea of, uh, you know, I guess celebrity representation and that sort of thing is, is something where, uh, you know, getting down to the ground and convincing Africa. I mean, I've, I'm always told in Kenya that it has to be a football player or <laughs> someone, but uh, I'm just curious about yes. more of a movement to represent that because we actually need the farmers themselves to believe that they're heroes, that they're doing really, really important work. And yes. so I'm just curious your thoughts on how to get more people involved in that. It's actually a great question. It's a yeah, question. <laughs> and it's, a, it's an important one. It's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, the president, uh, Alvaro of, of IFAD and I and Sabrina are having these really detailed conversations around advocacy, and what it looks like and how it shifts. In fact, you know, what is the brand language of farming? Do we know that? We know what the brand language of McDonald's is, right? What is the brand language of farming? And what do we do for that? It, and it seems like it's like, okay, well, why don't we just amplify it, tell some stories around it. But I think it's about the people. So we've got to populate the faces, the people, the character. We can't just brand them as farmers, yeah. smallholder farmers. These are people, these are communities. 
And we have to give them name. We have to give uh, we have to give uh, uh, um, story, character, and understanding. And we have to good old fashioned media, mm. good old fashioned marketing. Um, you know, we were talking earlier about advocacy and how you know I want to bring Idris and I want to bring a mini Idris and I want to bring another mini Idris <laughs> and someone you know because I want to bring people that have... not ready for that many mini. <laughs> 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 <Exactly>. <laughs> <laughs> is that is that an announcement? No, no, wait, no, no, wait, wait, wait. wait. <laughs> what I'm talking about is that I want to bring. It's like a hundred journalists kind of go. <laughs> what did you just see? <laughs> and a few more minutes. But I'm talking about you know big loud voices that feel as passionate as I do that are from those communities that are you know can tell these stories better than I can. Not just you know we should have four more seats here. Because it isn't just fair, it's just Idris and Sabrina. We don't come from the farms that we're talking about. We should have other voices. So to your point, I think it's a really, really good question. It's a really good thing for us to think about. You know, we have to find the farming McDonald's model, whatever that is. Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, we always make a point to say that we never want to feel like we're in a room speaking for mm -hmm. rural people. We're speaking with rural people, and it's about finding ways that everyone can speak with them. And um, there's a, a young African artist named Mr. Easy, who's really cool, who works with EFAD as well. And he did this TikTok campaign with EFAD about encouraging young people to look at agriculture as an entrepreneurial venture. And it was so successful. And it's just about finding the right voice for the right audience. And I, and I think you make such a good point. It might not even be a celebrity. It could just be someone that is admired for the success story that they have in that same field. Um, but we always try, because Idris does make a good point, if you're going to talk about anything and you do have a platform, to make sure you know what you're talking about mm. because... It you know, does help. It's, yeah, it does help <laughs> because it, it can become really easy to derail the efforts of an organization that's worked so hard if you come up and use a soapbox to just, mm. you know, flaunt whatever mm. it is that you want to flaunt for some, you know, kind of virtue-raising type thing. So we, we support organizations that we are passionate about, that we care about. It's not hard to care about the continent. You just said how beautiful it was. Right. You, know, you got to go to Kenya. So <laughs> you got to go to East Africa. Uh, no, uh, you, I mean, I was going to ask you what you love about East Africa because, uh, oh, you know, it's it is. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. I love the, and I love the people. Like, I find myself, I'm always in East Africa, and I'm in Kenya a lot because I found me there. I'm in Somalia a lot, but it is sometimes harder to get to where I'm from in Somalia. And uh, I just like the beauty. It's like there's, you can't convince me there's a more beautiful place on this planet than Khalifi. I don't know if you guys have been to Khalifi, Kenya. It's unbelievable. And I'm trying to, it just went without me. And I'm trying to get it for us to go together. It's like, damn. Um, I try to I do that there. every now and again. <laughs> You just need to drop a trip into to Freetown uh, one time, kind of, you know, without time. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, no, I could, probably couldn't. He's tracking me on my phone. <laughs> Get there before I do. Uh, any, more, any more questions? Yeah, yeah. I'm really keen to open the dialogue. You look like you have one. OK. Yeah, there's yes, a question yeah. here. Yeah, my name is John. I'm from Canada. Um, I'm from Canada. There's a microphone coming, actually, John, if you just yeah. one second. Really excited meeting Canadians. <laughs> Canadian conspiracy. And I, I agree with you on Kenya and Somalia. Been all over Africa, well, the world, and they, uh, they're at the top. Um, we work a lot with farmers in, in, in Canada and elsewhere, um, and one of the things we constantly hear is that the challenge is on the consumer side, and all of us as food consumers don't pay enough for what we're consuming and don't understand enough uh, about what goes into it and what we require of it through regulations. Um, do you think much and talk much about us as consumers, and curious what your thoughts are on how we can we can be uh, better contributors to uh, all, all that you've been speaking about. Yeah, I think that's it's such an important part of the puzzle. The consumer power in you know, buying smart, buying local, uh, supporting <coughs> farmers in your area, that's, it, big agro has some problems that need to be fixed. And those can only be fixed if pressure is applied in the right way. And I think that's absolutely through consumer power. But that's also a journey that we, we ourselves are on, educating ourselves about what it is that we're eating because everything's so convenient now. It's like you buy a bag of chips, where the potatoes come from? Where do, you know, and it, it's so important to make yourself aware of that issue. But when it comes to how we um, 
spread that that issue. I actually self admittedly have difficulty in that in that area. I don't know how best to communicate that when I speak to Can my best friend is a Canadian farmer. <laughs> you know, she's literally in Radville, Saskatchewan right now. Um, you know, and. Uh, it, when talking to her family and then hearing how we work with rural farmers, like you know there's so many interconnectivities and, and how do you approach these conversations in the right way? I'm still looking if anyone knows the right avenues or the right forums to be able to make those connectivities for everyday people because once you make that connection, people get it. You know, when it, once it affects your food and what you're eating, you have so much more of an appreciation for where the food is coming from. Um, so I think that's just an important point. It's oh, yeah. tough, it's tough in the, with, with what we're facing, many people with the cost of living and that kind of stuff, right? It's, it's hard. Really? Mm. You want things to be cheaper. You don't want to pay more for food. Right. Yeah. I, I think there's some really interesting lessons to be taken from the cocoa industry and, and, and what's happened there with sort of, you know, fair trade. And, you know, I don't think it's been taken far enough. And it's not been taken far enough because the, the big five chocolate companies are very, very powerful. It's all about money at the end of the day. But it needs to come down to, you know, the governments need to uh, apply some power to conscious consumers. We want to be fair, I think. I think there is a level of consciousness around the food we buy. If we know that it's come from farm to table and we have to pay a little bit of a premium for that and that, you know, spreads the wealth, I think people will embrace that. But the actual m communications around that are just mm -hmm. minimalized. Of course they're minimalized because you've got big conglomerates who can just pay to suppress that. Mm. I think there just needs to be a little bit of innovation around it. I think a little bit of lobbying. Um, social media is a really amazing tool to just raise the awareness. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it's a great I question. Love, I love hearing you talk. <laughs> so nice. I was just going to say that to him. Um, but no, I think I find the same problem in fashion where we, we want to sort of outcast fast fashion as the bad guy. And, you know, when I'm talking about more sustainable or greener practices in fashion, you can't forget about the single mother with five children who can only afford to go to H&M. I'm sorry, fast fashion is the only option. And it's the same in food. Um, you know, when I was growing up, my, we ate McDonald's a lot. My mom knew it wasn't the best for us, but sometimes that was all we could get because it was cheap and cheerful and easy. So you need to find a way to, to have these conversations without excluding anybody. What's your answer to that? That's so interesting that, to, to have that authenticity and to, and to talk about your early life. And then, what's your answer? How do you talk to families? You, you just don't leave anyone out. You understand that it's so much more complex than, oh, only buy organic and only shop at Whole Foods because that's great. It's not. It's, yeah. there, it's not an option for everybody, and that's just the reality of it. So then we need to go outside of the individuals, look at government, what kind of policies can be implemented around healthy food choices, particularly in schools for young people. It's so much bigger than the individual consumer, but the individual consumer is a, such a massive piece. And I think the coalition of farms, sorry, I know you've got a question. I know you've got a question too, but the coalition of farms is important. You know, farmers having the strength to say, no, 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 no. We're all going to stay at the same price. We're all going to try and raise our value and be respected. And that needs support around, you know, from all of us. I hate to say, I don't think we have time for any more. Oh, we have you? to. That gentleman was really patient. Yeah. One more question? One more. OK, One great. More. Oh, um, can sorry. we mix the questions into two? Yeah, can we do two at the same time? Two at the same time? Right, mine's very quick. It actually follows on from that nice comment from the Canadian. You need to go on the government level. So in Switzerland, we pay $100 for a kilo, 2.2 uh, pounds in, in <laughs> American, uh, British pounds. Okay, not the money, the weight. We pay a very high price for, for meat here. It's subsidized. We subsidize the small holdings. I know it's a different level, but it's done through governmental level. And when I go back to my home country in Britain, in Wales and Scotland, all the farmers are now trying to cut out the middleman, sell their produce locally and so mm. on. And this is really a way in the, in the richer countries to go to really give the farmers respect, which is what you say, so they can move forward. So it needs to be at a, a higher level, a policy level. Great, Absolutely. thank you for that, that's wicked. And that gentleman there, uh, yeah, just stand up, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'm from Vital Capital. We, uh, the microphone. microphone. There you go. Yeah. I'm Nimrod from uh, Vital Capital. We uh, invest in food in Africa, uh, heavily invested, um, uh, and all through smallholder uh, farmers. We work with 40,000 smallholder farmers. Uh, we've talked about, and I heard you talking about the success and the needs. Of course, there's a lot of needs and the success of the smallholder farmers. Um, I think that if we want to propel this industry, we have to talk about the success of the investors as well. Uh, and there's a lot of investors, private investors and private funds like us that invest through smallholder farmers and do 
good returns for them in, for the investors. I wanted to ask if you emphasize this as well, because I think this is the opportunity to mobilize a lot of uh, private investment into the industry. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. You need um, the success stories. You need the proof of concept to <laughs> you know, de-risk in some sense for other investment to come in. I think it's so important. Yeah, I think that the um, interfacing between countries, smallholder farmings, governments, and private sector uh, needs to be readdressed needs to be incentivized to work way better. Africa is open for business, left, right and center. It really is. And if you ignore that market space, you might as well ignore a whole chunk of your future, quite frankly, because it is, uh, we've heard it before, a sort of a breadbasket. But I do absolutely agree that there needs to be better sort of um, setups for uh, um, yeah, private sector to, to be able to participate and, and grow and grow. And I think the diaspora actually have a keen uh, sort of um, uh, role to play in that, personally. Yeah. Can I ask um, what you're doing about it to, and how are you showcasing to other investors and businesses? Um, we, uh, we are, first of all, have uh, our financial results that we can show that true working and true investing in smallholder farmers, be it Makedamia in Kenya, dairy in Uganda, or agro-industrial center in uh, West Africa, Angola, and other places, so they double or triple their income. Our investors make returns, you know, that they could, they, uh, that uh, they outperform, we outperform other um, uh, funds, so there's an alternative for investor money. And, uh, and about stories and branding, I mean, we are very happy to see an agropreneur coming with uh, a Lexus and a Rolex to work because that's the example that the young people uh, will want to follow. <laughs> Love that. But it is so important to publish those, that data and, that's, and those success stories and to share those stories. Yeah. Yeah, I think okay. we're probably out of time. But I'll, I'll keep time. talking if you don't. I know, we could just keep talking. <laughs> um, thank you both very much. It's just a real pleasure. Yeah.